I have been duped a couple of times. Individuals pulling the wool over my eyes. Me falling for their deception. A house deal, a speaker deal, a car deal. I could go on. All of them cost me. I was hoodwinked and bamboozled. I didn't see through their sham, through their duplicity, their dishonesty. I was con, tricked, misled, and swindled. And if I had more adjectives to describe their double-dealing, dishonest, duplicitous, unprincipled, unhandy, corrupt, and amoral behavior, I would use them. They were cheats. And I fell for their schemes. And when it comes to our walk with our Heavenly Father, Jesus warns us there are those who want to pull the wool over our eyes. Those who desire to deceive. Those who look the part, but inwardly their deception preys upon the faithful. Not me, you may say. That, that would never happen to me. I can spot a fraud a mile away. I can tell when someone is duping me. James, you just... You're just too gullible, too trusting. Yeah, maybe, probably. I'm sure you're right. I have this problem of giving people the benefit of the doubt. I see people as inherently good. I see you as inherently good. Is that being too trusting? Should I see you as inherently evil and not trust you? Am I too gullible, too sympathetic, too optimistic because I choose to see Christ in you and others and not their duplicity, which exists in all of us. You know, in describing his kingdom ethics, Jesus is moving us toward the application. He is warning us, warning us of those who want to lead us astray, lead us away from the truth. And here's what I know about the truth. Everyone claims one. Everyone claims to have a truth. Everyone holds to a belief system. Everyone. A set of standards, principled or unprincipled, claiming to know the way of life. And Jesus warns us here as those helpless and harassed sheep without a shepherd on that hillside to be on their guard, to watch out for those who deceive. All right, listen, listen to our text for today in the Sermon on the Mount. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Okay, so what do you, what do you notice just right here off the bat? What I notice is that false prophets hide themselves in sheep's clothing. False prophets look like other sheep, the sheep in the pen with you. One cannot look at their exterior coat and notice any different, but underneath the outer shell is lurking a savage wolf, one who wants to lead astray, one who wants to devour you. Now, this is, this is the first warning from Jesus about false prophets, but it is not the last. Listen to these. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. And one more. And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. So why is this so important for Jesus? Why is Jesus so concerned about our souls, about the deception which often traps us? Are we truly that gullible? And I have questions. I have questions. Like, whom do I trust? To whom do I listen? Why are we so susceptible to these wolves? How would we know if we were being led astray? And how would we know if they are false prophets? All right, can I share with you my greatest fears of Christianity right now? 
why our churches, no matter one's tradition, are losing sheep in alar alarming numbers? Why we are being drawn away by the schemes of the devil, his savage wolves dressed in sheep clothing? Okay, I, I have four things, four reasons. And I don't, want to, I don't want to take too long on this, but I do think it is really, really, really important. And the first one, I'm, it's hard to hear. We are biblically illiterate. Let me say that again. When it comes to our knowledge of the scriptures, we lack knowledge. That's why we're so susceptible. Let, let, me, give you, let me just give you some statistics from Barna Research in July of 2020. Between early 2019 and 2020, the percentage of U.S. adults who saw the, the use of the Bible, uh, using the Bible daily, dropped from 14 to 9 percent. According to the State of the Bible report by Barna and the American Bible Society, overall about a fifth, 22% of U.S. adults interact with the Bible multiple times a week, not counting scripture, used at church according to a January survey. 60% read the Bible four times per year or less. My greatest fear is that our corporate worship is creating spectator Christians. We show up and get our weekly dose of Jesus, and we go home. Great sermon, James. Thanks for the message, James. Great worship service, Austin. As a whole, according to research, we spend very little time in Scripture outside church's exposition of the Bible. And yes, I know. I know. I, I, I know. The answer to all our questions is just a click away. All I have to do is ask Siri or Alexa, and the answer pops up. I can find anything I need online. All the answers to my questions. I wish we, including myself, were more like the Bereans in Acts chapter 17. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Paul says, examining the scriptures daily is a noble thing. In large part, our worship is often, you do, I watch. You do, I watch. According to Barnum, very few are engaged. But what if, what if, what if, what if, what if we came with pad and pencil in hand every single Sunday? What if we actually opened our Bibles and highlighted those passages which spoke to us on the screen? What if, what if we filled in the blanks on the outline? What if, what if we loaded the preacher down with questions following the sermon? And what if, what if we went back to our homes? and did further research to see if what was said was accurate and correct. The number one reason we are susceptible to false prophets is our biblical illiteracy. All right, number two. The second reason we are susceptible to false prophets is our pride. Our pride. Jesus said you will recognize them by their fruits. You will recognize the false prophets by the produce of their lives. Listen, listen to me, please. I, I'm, I'm not trying to make anyone mad or upset. I, I'm concerned. I'm really concerned. For most of us, our beliefs have been formed through our heritage, through our traditions, and through our families. We believe this because it's what we've always believed. We believe mostly because our parents told us what to believe. And there's much pride in this family of faith to which we belong. And I, and I thank God for that. But, but, very few of us, very few of us have taken the time to examine the following questions. Is what I believe really real? Is what I believe really real? Many, many years ago, I took it upon myself to do an intensive study of that question. I wanted to know for myself if what I believed was true. And while I'm all in with this tradition, there are some things which I disagree. And I would venture that most of us have gone through the same metamorphosis. And the reason this question is so important, if you remember from last week, 
We choose the path. We choose the way. And God will honor our choices. On the day of judgment, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Romans 14 verse 12. Each of us will answer for our own beliefs. Not, not James. James. Beliefs. Not my beliefs and not, not the elders' beliefs. You will answer for your own. We will stand before God and give an account of our own beliefs. So, brothers and sisters, should I be satisfied to leave my salvation, my eternity in the hands of another? See, often our pride is so strong and our will so unbendable that we are unwilling to seek and search for truth. We know what is right. And if it was good enough for my grandparents, and my parents is good enough for me. And I'm not saying anyone's wrong. What I am saying is that our pride often keeps us from seeking and discovering God and his word. There are many who lack a biblical foundation to justify and to even defend their beliefs. But God can handle our questions, and God honors and desires those who seek him, those who have questions. Researching our faith is a good thing in the eyes of God, and what we find will surprise us. Listen to this. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver or search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. That's Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, one of my favorite. We live in an age where every single one of us has research tools at our fingertips to dig and to search for truth found in God. Bible study tools can be found online. Word study tools, Greek and Hebrew tools, cross-reference tool, contextual tools, and history tools. We could spend the rest of our lives digging into the Word of God and find hidden treasures daily. Please, Let's not allow our pride and our arrogance stand in the way of seeking the truth found in God. All right, so here's number three. The third reason we are susceptible to false prophets is our need to perform, to work out our salvation. Paul says this, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Now remember, Paul's talking to the Galatians who were told that, told that salvation came through circumcision. It, if one was not circumcised, they were not saved. And Paul says they were submitting to a yoke of slavery. Look at this, verse 7. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who caused you. Paul is reminding his brothers and sisters that false prophets have led you astray by demanding your works earn your salvation. I mean, how many of us just want a list? If I do this, or if I do that, or if I don't do this, or if I don't do that, then I'm on the right track to righteousness. Just, just give me a list, and I will keep the rules. How often does our faith become an entitlement of deeds performed and actions omitted? To those who enslaved the Galatians with circumcision, Paul says, I wish those who unsettled you would emasculate themselves. It's very powerful language. Brothers and sisters, our salvation is not earned. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. I'm almost positive that you've noticed the many different church signs found in our town. Each of them claiming a truth of their own. Each of them believing their way is the correct way to God and his son, Jesus. We believe a truth. They believe a truth. And each willing to place their soul in the hands of their tradition. Each of them believing the way they worship and the way they structure their church is true and right and 
holy. Listen, listen to me closely. Listen to me closely. The name on our building will not save us. I'm grateful Lake Homa is your ecclesia, your gathering of people, your body, your church home. But the way we worship and the way we have structured our church will not save us. The only one who can save us is Jesus Christ. And we know this. We talked about it last week. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Isn't that, is, is, it is not what we do. It's not how we structure our church that will save us. It is by grace through faith by which we will be saved. And we ought to be dispensers of grace to all those who call Jesus Lord. So number three was the third reason we're susceptible to false prophets is our need to perform to work out our salvation. Okay, and then last. And last, the fourth reason we're susceptible to false prophets. We are easily led astray. You know, Jesus was concerned about those wolves who led his followers astray. And even Paul, John, James, and Peter were concerned about those who would lead the believers astray in their writings. Listen to this. But I'm afraid that as the servant, serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts would be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, and if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, and if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. We are easily led astray. The serpent, the deceiver of this world, deceives those who dwell on the earth. And we know this. We know this. But the great deceiver is closer than we think. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1, verse 8. Listen to this one. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to the human tradition, according to the elementary spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. The apostles were concerned. Jesus is concerned about his hearers, those listening on the hillside, the lost sheep for whom Jesus came to save. Jesus is worried the hearers will fall into the mouths of ravenous wolves who will take advantage of them. Yes, deception is real. Deception occurs, and Jesus is reminding us how to spot the enemy. And he says this, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Look at this picture. These, these are plants in my front flower bed. I, I don't know what they're called. But those spikes that you see, they hurt. Tending to them demands great care. I mean, one must wear gloves, and even jeans are not thick enough when backing up into them. And I can tell you one thing. It's painful. I've done it many times. Thistles and thorn bushes do not produce grapes or figs. They produce pain. And if grape vines and thorn bushes are growing together, which one is going to win? Which one's going to win? This plant you see on the screen is an innocent enough plant. It looks good, but it turns sinister when one is unaware of its nature. That's how false prophets are. False prophets by nature have a way of grabbing us and deceiving us. So, how can we spot them? How can we spot them? All right, look at this similar passage in Luke chapter 6. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit, for figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a brabble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasures produces evil. 
for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. All right, two ways, two ways we can spot, spot false prophets. Two ways. Number one is bad teaching. Bad teaching. But how do I know if it's bad? Listen to this passage. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth, talking about Jesus, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. This is God speaking. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. Brothers and sisters, there's a reason. 32,000 different Christian traditions exist in our world today. Everyone claiming the truth of their own. We make the Bible say what we want it to say. Every tradition claiming a truth of their, their own. I believe this passage that you saw on the screen to be true. This passage, which is spoken by God himself, is restated by Jesus himself in John chapter 12, verses 44 through 50. This ought to be the foundation for recognizing false prophets. How often have we heard someone say, God said, God told me. How does one know if they're even saying what is true? How do we know if they're speaking the truth? Is the one teaching speaking the very words of God? That's how we know. Are they speaking the very words of Jesus Christ? And the only way we will know this to be true, the only way all of us will know this to be true, is if we are more like the Bereans who receive the word with eagerness. And then they examine the scriptures. They search to make sure what was said was true. Bad teaching can only be assessed and recognized if we seek the truth as found in the mouth of God as his son and his son Jesus Christ. Okay, that's number one, bad teaching. Number two, we recognize false prophets by their bad living. Listen to this passage. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly belie believed, knowing from whom you believed it. Okay, look at the fruit. Look at the fruit. What are they producing? Now, I will tell you, that this is very difficult because all of us present a good image. All of us have been deceived. My question, my question, who truly knows the heart of man except God? Who truly knows the intent of one's heart except God alone? Okay, and how would we know if they are false prophets? How would we know? All right, let me remind you of what Paul says. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause division and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Jesus, but their own appetites by smooth talk and flattery. They deceive at the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. All right, brothers and sisters, false prophets can do much harm. Can they not? Can they not? Can, they can tear churches apart. They can destroy one's faith in the foundation of believers. They can lead people in a way in which Jesus never spoke, never intended them to go. Never. And my hope and my desire are that none of you will be led astray from the truth. None of you. So, what is truth? What is truth? Well, I'll leave you with these words from the Apostle, Apostle John to think about. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, 
and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. That's the truth. I love you, Lycoma. May your eyes always be open and your heart always seeking for the truth found in God and in his Son, Jesus Christ. 